that. Is it something music that, like you had in your head, like it was easy to write? Or did you really have to, like, how many drafts before you got it right? It start, I imagined it at first as a series. Um, and I quickly realized that uh, I had to stop listening to others, uh, you know, agents, producers, and producing partners' opinions of what it should be and what the market is requesting. And I, I said, this is a feature. Like, movies is what I know. Uh, I know how to structure a movie. Um, just because I've watched so many. And they were thinking, oh, this naive young kid. He doesn't, yeah. he doesn't know. I'm sure they're, you're getting that. I said I want autobiographical experience because I, I feel like I've never seen synesthesia depicted on, on, on screen. I feel like I've never seen um, Brazilian culture represented in this way on screen. Um, certainly not the Brazilian American experience. Like, I, if, Can I take something for, as formulaic as a rom-com and counterbalance that with some complex ideas, which is... Uh, Brazilian culture, the Brazilian American experience, and synesthesia. And that was the vision. And everyone was like, dude, just make a movie about a guy who moves to Hollywood, uh, got getting famous on the internet, um, like a modern day digital entourage. I was like, I don't know if I'm passionate about that story at all. That's the key. You got to be passionate about it. So that whole series idea fell apart. A year later, I met Dan Lagana, great writer, collaborator. We have a very, very symbiotic relationship and process. And uh, yeah, I shot a sizzle. I took that sizzle out. Amazon loved it. And um, how how much did the sizzle cost? Cost about fifteen grand. Fifteen grand. Fifteen to fifteen to twenty grand. Yeah, it's like the most. And I ever you told spent the story video. in a way in that fifteen minutes. Yeah, it was essentially a poor man's version. Not a poor man's version. Um, a version of the opening scene. Um, so I self funded the thing, and um, I just put my friends in it, and I saw a show called Stomp. Yep. in New York. Um, and the the director and choreographer of that, and, and he's in it as well, Marival de Santos, who's a stomper for 20 years. I was like, this is what I need. This is what I need. A bunch of people, a bunch of stompers, a street drum corps, people who can turn items into instruments. So not really a dancer, not a musician, a stomper. We call them rhythm performers. We invented a, a job um, for the film. Marival de came and we shot the sizzle about a kid who's just getting distracted by music. And uh, and you pitched it just to Amazon. That was your first. I think it was the very first pitch, and they loved it. And the next day, we got a really, a really, really good call. And they said, "We'll finance this." They did. They said that was a, one of the more interesting pitches we've ever seen. I mean, I brought a puppet to the pitch. I brought my keyboard to the pitch. I was running around the room like it wasn't your typical what? movie pitch. Yeah. How long was the pitch? Uh, I want to say like a, a tight. There were 40 minutes. And they were something. entertained the whole time. Yeah. That's a long pitch. Usually yeah. people want you in and out in 15. No, me and Dan, we broke the whole story. But as we we're breaking the story, I'll, you know, because I'll, I'll, I'll tell them about, you know, a double date where you go on a date with one person and the other girl that you are kind of seeing is on the other side of the restaurant and you got to, in a miss doubtfire type of way, flip between both tables uh, while having a conversation with the musician, the lounge musician through music. And yeah, it's one thing to say that. It's another thing to do it. So I, I performed that piece live with the keyboard. Um, uh, and What? And it Did was you like mess up at all? Yeah, but that was a part of it. it was, that's the fun part is messing up, you know, the imperfection. Right. And they were like, we don't know what the hell just happened, but we'll make the movie. Did you realize what you were getting into when Amazon said, great, we'll give you all this money. You're going to go make this movie. You love it. <laughs> nope. And then you realized, I'm directing. I wrote it. Uh, I, I'm starring in it. I'm composing it. Because I, on a smaller scale, directed this little raunchy comedy that I wrote and starred in. And mm -hmm. honestly, it was 17 days and no money. And I honestly thought I was going to die. I really, I was so tired that I thought I'm going to die on the set. And that's what's going to happen. And it wasn't even joking. I was that tired. Yeah. So how did you, how are you able to do that? And can you sleep like that? Can you fall asleep like that? no no i didn't i didn't sleep for for a few months um certainly not during these five and a half weeks that we shot but it's a lot a lot more facility when you have a budget and a supportive studio of course however i think the feeling of thinking you're gonna die um remains consistent whether it's a hundred million dollar blockbuster or a five hundred thousand dollar indie um really really hard and I, I i severely underestimated just how hard hard it is to to uh make a film um and satisfy 
producers and studio and make sure you're you have enough time and the constraints of budget and end time um for me i i signed up to wear a lot a lot of hats i was in the film and i i, I wrote it and i directed it and i made the music um so so yeah i i, I didn't get to you know I didn't get to, you have a couple hours to go to your trailer while we set up lights. No, no, I was there setting up the lights, you know? Right. I mean, did you ever hit a point during the filmmaking where you're like, you feel like a failure? Or you feel like I'm dropping the ball? I feel like uh, I, I don't know what I should. I feel like I'm not competent. Did you ever feel like that? No. Not once? No. No, I... I That's um... the difference between me and you. <laughs> That's Look, the fucking difference. There are obstacles. I have doubts, but I was very confident in walking team, into this too. film and in my team because because it took I was in development for so long. You know, we had a a year's worth of writing and rewriting, um, different drafts. Right. Um, two years of a pandemic world, um, plus another six to eight months. We're talking three to four years of this film just being in limbo. That limbo was very frustrating. In retrospect, it was exactly what I needed because I had so much time with the material. When I got to the day, nothing was left to chance. I knew every, I had the whole edit in my head before we started shooting. You're like Hitchcock. Hitchcock. <laughs> That's what he did. He'd have the whole movie in his head. Mm -hmm. Or maybe that was Kubrick. Sounds more like a, a Kubrick thing. I've heard this fact and I don't know who it is. I think it's Hitchcock. I think a lot of film, I mean, a great filmmaker is an editor. You have it? to think you know? about the editing when you have think. to think about I that. always think when I'm writing, I'm, I imagine the scene. I'm in the scene as mm -hmm. an actor, where I'm looking, mm -hmm. how I'm feeling, what's happening around me. That's what I try to do. Exactly. And things inevitably change depending on performance and some, some things that you find in the edit. But man, 90% of this thing was locked, locked. Like these set pieces, I knew exactly where the camera was going to cut and on which beat it was going to cut. That's crazy.